I've been working in the industry for 30 years, and uh, her question is that has it changed in terms of having female in the industry? I think it has changed some, certainly, but overall, though, the percentage of women being software engineer, especially, they're still like a big kind of lag behind like the male counterpart, yeah. But recently, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of groups, right, like in different cities. For example, in the US, we have this group called Girls, Girl Develop It. I don't know if it's over in Europe, too. But I think in Europe, for Java, there's a Duchess, Java J. Duchess, and they're advocating women to um, be doing Java. And I, I'm not sure how prevalent it is here in the Europe, but in the US, we certainly have local chapters like, that are like women, um, encouraging women to get into engineering and software. Yeah, but overall, it, there's still a big gap. It's kind of unfortunate, yeah. So, but I think that also too, I, I spoke at uh, Oracle Co1, that um, conference by Oracle back in October, and I actually ran a session on women, how, like how women can actually help in this industry to bridge like the technical gap. And uh, that generated a lot of interesting conversations too. That, um, that we feel what we can do, as, especially as female engineers, how can we attract more women to come into the field? Yeah, and it's not really intimidating. It, it should be fun to doing software. Yeah, yeah. I have to talk to you afterwards too. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, so, so I guess I'll, I'll start. Maybe I'll sit so then I don't block this. <laughs> so, and also too, if, if you find that there's something I may be not clear, especially because of the language. I'm not sure you know, if I'm explaining myself well. Please feel free to slow me down or ask questions or yell at me and say, don't worry, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all like, very flexible. So, okay. So first of all, thank you very much for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Mary Gwigleski, although I have to point out I don't look like Polish, but I have a Polish name. It's because of my um, family that I marry into. So they are Polish Americans. So yeah. So um, anyway, so I'm originally from uh, originally from Hong Kong, and then I came went to the U.S. for university. Then I end up staying. I marry my husband, and then I've been like living in Chicago for the past 15 years or so. Um, before that, I was in Boston and also like in San Francisco. So I've lived in different cities inside the U.S. Um, and I've been working as a software engineer for since 1988 when I graduated. Um, I actually worked a bit with C and Unix in the 90s. Um, I don't know if, if anybody is still using Unix, just C and Unix, yeah, probably, right? Yeah, there's still value in that too, is a lot of speed in like doing like C, for example, and I think doing some of the embedded devices. And, but um, so at that time though, I was uh, um, working for product companies, um, like Sybase um, back then was doing um, the application, the J2EE server. So I was on J2EE, J2EE server team. So, and then I moved to Chicago in 2004. And then since then, I've been mostly in the application area, mostly too in Java application. And then in the two years ago, I was with a company called US Cellular. Just now I mentioned too, as a cell phone service provider. So over there, they are so cell phone service and there was a My Account application. So I helped them out with that and to help them to um, launch it onto the mobile platform as a native app, but using the hybrid approach. So my talk to mainly is talking about the experience I had using that hybrid mobile app approach. Um, okay. Okay, so this talk too, I, I did it too at um, Def Nexus in uh, earlier the year um, in, in um, Atlanta. And that's also a Java developer conference. It's, it's quite big too, it's after Java one. So at that time, I actually the title, because I was pairing with my um, co-presenter, co I'm also, by the way, too, also I run the Chicago Java Users Group. So I have folks in there that we kind of paired together and did this talk, and we call it what to do when your boss needs a native mobile app in less than 24 hours. So like just basically showing you a way of how to make your no ordinary web app to be able to launch on the mobile platforms quicker. So, so first of all, I'd like to just show some of the challenges in an enterprise IT environment. Um, how many of you are actually working in, say, big companies, working with many different systems and different, yeah, I think a lot of us, yeah, there's a few of us, right? Yeah, so I just want to kind of quickly show you about this picture that when I was at US Cellular, that's the 
environment that I was dealing with, and then as a developer, they don't care about what backgrounds, oh, I shouldn't say they don't care, but they, the business side, they just want work to be done quickly. They don't really worry about how you do it. So from a developer's point of view, I actually was new to, to doing uh, mobile um, kind of development, and the team was small. And then we were told, if you look into here too, that's, we have that J2E, like a proprietary backend, and that was done by some other company, uh, an outsourced company, and they do, uh, is, is actually older, like EJB implementation. So a lot of EJB beans and all that, and that was access to an Oracle enterprise service bus, like ESB, and through a SOAP interface. And from, from a client, they have to access the SOAP um, web services. And uh, so over there at USL there too, for the front end, they had another vendor that handled it. Um, and that was like through, there's a Node.js piece that actually has some microservices in Seneca, uh, using Seneca, and so that's RESTful web services and also cache in Redis. And then um, over here too, then basically the external facing is through an Apache web server. And actually the front end then um, initially was just jQuery. And then the company decided, well, make it a little bit more modern. So then we kind of use uh, AngularJS for the front end. And over there too, th um, there's also the e-commerce component, which is leveraging on Oracle ATG um, e-commerce. How many of you have, are working on e-commerce systems? I think quite a few. Yeah, so you understand. So kind of, it makes this kind of ecosystem quite complex. You have to try to integrate all of them and their security aspect. And then, of course, too, there's, uh, for any kind of e-commerce system, you also have a content management system, too, which, in this case, Oracle ATG also has a content uh, CMS to, to handle the catalog. Um, and then, um, so basically, too, then company says, well, the, originally, the um, users, too, customers, they were just using their phone, using a, not a native app, it was just using um, your phone and the phone browser to actually access your web interface for doing my account. Like you log on as a cell phone customer, you check your account balance, you do the shopping. And that was just through the web browser. And of course, customers start to complain, well, it doesn't work too good if it is not a native app. So, so immediately too, like it, you know, we were told like, well, we need to do this quickly. How can we do it in mobile app? Um, quickly launch it and convert it into mobile app. And so, okay, so over here too, the, the challenge then we were facing was that nobody knew, all of us were just regular programmers, Java developers for the back end or doing Angular JavaScript front end. So nobody, I mean, even if we had some mobile app, like a little bit of Android because of my Java experience, we didn't really know enough. So then we were doing some investigation and eventually too, we were saying, well, what can we do? So then we study the different options we have and then we chose to use a hybrid approach so for the benefits of using hybrid approach is that there's no need for you to know deeply about anything Android or anything iOS or Windows, um, whatever this framework, in this case, Apache Cordova, uh, and it supports um, obviously Android and iOS were the two platforms we've chosen to do. So, so let's take a look. So what is Cordova? So it is a hybrid mobile application development platform. And essentially, too, it takes your normal web app, which is like HTML, um, regular HTML, um, CSS, your know, images, your JavaScript. And basically, you can, JavaScript can be like React to um, any kind of JavaScript, Angular, or just regular jQuery, and yeah, even like, a, yeah, like the, any kind of plain old vanilla JavaScript, it will take that. And basically, take that and renders this HTML and runs it on your phone um, through another layer. It's called WebView. So in some ways too, WebView is the, the layer that interprets your JavaScript and be, being with that, the WebView then is able to con connect and talk to your native operating system underneath, yeah. And then you will be wondering too, well then how can normal web app, it doesn't know how to interact with your phone, with your camera, with your accelerometer, and all of the other like contacts and things that are native to your phones. So for Cordova, that's the nice thing about it is that um, they have what they call plugins. They have some core plugins themselves too, and for the camera interface, for example. But other plugins too, you can also do it. It allows you to write your own user um, customized plugins too. So that's kind of like a nice kind of way for you to, that allow you to talk to your phone. Yeah, just using, essentially using JavaScript um, to do it, so. So that's that. 
So again, I just want to point out too, so the hybrid versus native, what are the differences? So you look at the right side, the native framework talks directly to your mobile operating system. Whereas like if you use a hybrid approach, um, then say in this case, Cordova will then wrap your code and basically it is a considering like a web wrapper framework. It wraps your code. And basically Cordova actually has two parts to it. They will have the native, it generates the code, the native code, plus also the JavaScript. So the JavaScript side then will be interpreted through the web view. And then with that, then it's able to talk to your under, underlying mobile OS. However, as you can see, then the problem with this is it will be have, have a performance issue in there. So just wanted to point out. So again, I go back a little for what I talked about earlier with the Cordova plugins. So as you can see too, over here, then we have, um, like for example, the core, there's a bunch of core plugins, talk to your camera, um, the capture, the battery status, all these, um, yeah, all, yeah, let's see, the devices and some of the events is basically can be captured using through your core plugin. And then to interact with Cordova is this, the command line you can do. Um, and then um, there's embedded web views and, and all the other plugin interfaces. Um, and then just a word to point out is that um, for Cordova, it's, it's, a, it's how do you install it? First, you do need to have Node.js install, and you have Node.js, or how many of you are familiar with Node.js? Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's good. So at least I think I'm not like being a little too far ahead. So you do need your, to install your Node, and then with Node, it comes with NPM, the package manager. So you can then use your package, package manager to install your Cordova. And that's how you, you can install it. And, and then there's also the Cordova. Um, there are many parts to it. You need the core, plus also then the command line, the CLI too, with it, so. Okay, so I'll go back a little again, talking about Cordova plugins here. It just explains a plugin is really a bit of a, a add-on code that provides JavaScript interface to the native components. So that's why this it allows you to, your app to use native device capabilities beyond what is available in your normal web app. Um, and then one plugin I thought I can point out is that if you're ever interested in really using this approach is I, we found it very useful is the hot code push plugin. So what hot code push does is that it allows you to update your app silently. So then this way you don't require your, your user of your mobile app to do like to do like manual update. If ever, any time, although I do have to point out is that if you're changing the structure of your web app, then you will, you do, you will need to rebuild your whole app using Cordova and then require your customer. Eventually you, you generate the APK for Android, like an Android um, delivered um, package, right? Have them download it. But otherwise too, if you're just making changes such as images, CSS files or some JavaScript, there's really no need for them to re-download the code because, or re-download your app because it will take a long time. So what this plugin is really useful is that it will silently, if every time, if they log on to their app, um, then basically too, the, with the hot code push plugin, you can configure it. So then the app um, immediately too, when you log on, so your server sends that, okay, a, a client app is log on, then it will, basically go and check to see what's on your device. And if there are any, um, there are any like changes that needs the server to push it to your phone, then the hot code push will take care of pushing all the changes to your phone and all like done silently. So then when you log on, basically user is using it and it will basically up update whatever is needs to be updated. So we found that to be very useful. But the, the little drawback is that then when it comes to testing, it can be a bit of a challenge because like between different different updates on our server, all of these resources, then we have to kind of basically check and make sure the hot code push is, is, is working correctly, the plugin. So we basically have decided to just use a internal version system to identify every code push. Then we also then will mark it on the, on our, um, the mobile app developed, uh, like tester phone will have that, that version. Then by that we can then tell if the hot code push is doing its job correctly. So basically you log on, if I have version 50 on my phone, then the service I have 55, then I know, okay, you are on 50, then now I know I need to push all these changes to your phone like that. So, so that was just a, um, like something I'd like to share that we found to be very useful as a, as a Cordova plugin, so. Okay.
And then um, another interesting part to Cordova is about the it Cordova events. So there's this one, you see that these are like all the events and then the, the devices that support all these events, the mobile operating system. So the first and foremost, the most important is the event called device ready. So device ready, will, it's very, very much uh, very needed because when Cordova comes up again, Cordova has the JavaScript part and also the native code part. So when things are being loaded, um, we need to have some way to kind of signal so that your application doesn't go ahead, won't go ahead and make calls to your JavaScript before your DOM gets all loaded. So in other words, we want to wait for Cordova. All of the device APIs is ready. And so when it's ready, then basically signal to your app, to, to your mobile app on your phone that, okay, the device is ready now. Now your app can then start to do, do some work that it needs to do. So basically the device ready is important because then when, when it's ready, it signals to your app that, okay, now you're ready to do, because then Cordova is now ready on your phone, like the, all the device APIs is loaded. So, And then, of course, too, there are other um, Cordova events, too, that are tied to your phone capability, like, you know, your pause, your resume, back button, menu button, button, search button, all these start call, end call, volume, up and down. You can also, like, um, interact um, through using Cordova events, too in your app, so. Okay, so at this point, I'll just switch over to do a, a, some demonstration. Um, but I have to caution, too, is that it's my fault because I, I was doing some work prior to this, trying to set up, but I was running into some issue and it may not be working correctly, but at least I wanted to show you like how to use Cordova quickly. And the idea for this talk is how can we quickly turn just a normal web app, turn it and launch it onto the phone, so. But I'll just quickly do this, and I do need to end my end this uh, slide for now because I somehow my my system may not work otherwise. So, oops. So how do we kind of quickly generate like a just a dummy app first? So I'll I'll show that to you first. Okay. So let's say I'm I'm over here, and then I want to do a create create just a dummy code over app. So um, I can use the Cordova doing a, like a create, let's say um, DevOps VA. Is this, can you see okay? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so I just use, you basically want to create a new Cordova project is using Cordova um, create, and then I just give it a name. I call it DevOps uh, UA. So after I do that, then you see that you see that um, this is the folder that this is the folder it creates. But think of it kind of a container. That's what I've created. It's just a container. So if I go if I go in here, then you see this is like by default. It will create a folder for you that contains. It will, you see there's a config.xml, and that's a global uh, configuration file that Cordova uses. And I will take a quick look into it. Then I also want to point out that there's a platforms directory as well as as well as the plugins, and then the resource file, and then the www folder is where Cordova will take your web app, and that's where you want to copy your web app into, where Cordova will take it and basically wrap it and generate the native code for you. But I'll, I'll just do a quick um, look inside some of these um, uh, generated files and folder. Let's take a look. So over here at the con config.xml, over here you see that it just generate like some generic like in the XML format, um, the name of your, your app. Um, obviously you can all modify and update these too. Um, so name, description, and some email. Um, by default, it has the code over apache.org. Um, then if you look into it here too, there's a section on the platform. So by default, it always will have an Android entry and then also iOS. But of course too, if you want to do, let's say um, Blackberry, it, which it supports too, um, and other, um, I think Windows Phone too, it also will have it too. But I'll also show you quickly one thing. So if you do a Cordova platform, Cordova platform dash LS, then
then it will give you a list of what has been installed. And then also a, a, a bunch of like what you can be installing, what it has available. So, yeah. So here you see there's Android is the 7.11 and browser is uh, basically the like what some I think is Chrome browser too. That one I haven't used it. So and then iOS and then OS X is the Mac um, and also Windows too. So over here what we will do is I'll take a look into the platform directory. So you see that right now, before I do anything, it's nothing is in there. But let's do, do something. Um, to add your platform, you can just run platform and then add, add. So basically just called over platform add, and then I want to add Android. So over here, then it will then do all the fetching. I think I, yeah, okay, good. I'm co I just want to make sure I'm connected to the internet, which I am, so. But it may take a bit of time. It depends on the connection. So, hmm. it is taking a bit too long. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not very good. But okay, <laughs> what I can do is I I already have some things I'm testing. So let's say pretend that I'm doing a cooking show, right? So these I'm trying to cook, but the you know, the oven's too slow. So I'll switch to something that's already pre-made. <laughs> so I'll show that. <laughs> so. I'll switch to another window. Um, let's say I, I go to this one that I was gonna show. Is not this one. Okay, so when I join, I get to show. When I join, I, I won't, I will definitely get to show. I think that is the tab. It does not tell. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Oops. <laughs> Doesn't like it. There we go. Let me just make sure. Sorry. <laughs> oh well. Okay. Well, in the meantime, yeah rather than wasting your time. But what I can kind of quickly show you, as I mentioned, is that I have some that are, it's already working. So let me quickly um, bring that up and show it to you. Okay, so actually, I have one that I already did earlier. Um, I went to Denver Jug and I did one too, so. Um, so basically, um, this is sort of like what it's got created, um, and I'll just quickly uh, show that to you. Okay, so over here, if I just now I was running the ad platform. So when when you actually have the platform, then you you see. Okay, I'm just. Over here, right? So it generated the Android folder. So if you do a find, then basically, this is it generates a whole bunch of all the native code for you too. So it's in some ways is a time saver. Although you have to s look at it this way, it's just boilerplate code, right? So nothing like too specific cater for your needs. But at least I wanted to show quickly too. It is ready to be launched as a mobile app too at this point. So, okay. so the platform folder is filled up. And then if you go back over here, 
So by default, too, it generates that www folder for you. And this is where you can put your, your web app in. But for now, it's a dummy web app. Um, but I'll also quickly show you, you can launch it too. So it generates that. So with that, what you can run is that then do a Cordova uh, build. And you don't have to specify, um, let's say, right? Over now, over here, we have, oops. Okay, so over here, um, this particular one is install Android 712. So it's already there. So I can then run a Cordova build. So by default, then it knows it's the Android. It will build that for you. So okay. And then one note to point out is that um, before you can do that, obviously it's Android, so you do want to install Gradle. I make sure you have Gradle. And also I want to point out is that a mistake I ran into was that I, I, I installed the Gradle that's actually 4.0. Um, that actually, that broke my build. And the four, it looks like the, the four, Gradle 4 right now is not um, quite compatible yet with the Android version that Cordova is supporting. And that's one thing too is using a hybrid approach like this with a uh, platform like Cordova, you always, it will always be lagging behind a little bit because anytime your native platform has any updates, it doesn't, Cordova, if it, has, if it hasn't been updated yet, then it will break, some things will break. So that was a mistake I ran into was the Gradle was four, then it was having issue and I had to basically downgrade it back into like the three, like a Gradle three. So presumably you're familiar with using Gradle build, right? Yeah, or some of you or use it. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is, I'm using Vectorio. So, so now it looks like it built it. So if you look at this, then it generates uh, for Android. It, it generated the, by default is the app is in debug build and it generates the um, APK file for you. So APK file to Android is like jar or war to Java. Yeah, so it's for the, um, packaging it. Up. And then at this point too, then you can do a run. So right now, what it does is it tries to bring it up. And actually, let's see what happens. I'm also connected my phone to it too. Um, it's supposed to then, if I don't tell it, if I say run, it should then, um, it may actually deploy to my phone too because my phone is, uh, my device is connected. But let's see, sometimes it would actually go to the emulator too. Um, but my emulator too is, is for some reason, is having some issue. <laughs> that it does sometimes too when you go, because as such, they are just emulator. And then if I, I was testing things um, a few times, so then I think some of this stuff internally, it's being upset or not quite working. So I had to clean it all up. But once I clean it all up, then the emulator would take a long time to load too on my um, laptop. So let's see, if it doesn't load, then I'll just put it onto the phone and then you can just quickly see it can be launched quite quickly is what it is, so yeah. I'll just restart, um, power it on and off. Sometimes if you power on and off your emulator, it may clear up some of the cache from before, so. I guess in, in this case, let me, let me shut down my emulator and restart it and see if it works better. So one of the things too for doing Android, um, you can obviously use your Android Studio. And also another thing is in order to use your Android emulator, make sure you also um, install your SDK, the Android SDK Studio too. So inside, that's, inside your studio, you can then define your, em your devices. You do need your virtual devices to be defined, so then, then you can use the emulator function. So, um, although, I think right now, okay. So let me, yeah, let, let me just do this one thing. Um, so Android has, um, Android debugger is ADB. Then you can take a look to see what is actually, what your devices are. So right now if I run ADB and devices and you did a dash L, it'll show you the list of devices that I attach. But because I just now I shut down my emulator. So in right now you can see that it's actually, um, it doesn't, it, it can't find any devices. So let's see, um, I'll try to, 
I'll try to like run it again. So essentially, it's deploy it again during a run. Maybe this time I'll just say emulator um, explicitly and then say Android. So if I've run into this too, because if it's freshly started, then it will complain to um, that some error and it's still authorizing. So at this point, what we can do is power it off again. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'll clear. Actually, I'll leave it on this time, and um, then we run my command. Yeah, I do have to apologize too. Sometimes this uh, emulator thing is, doesn't always cooperate. <laughs> but like I said, I'm not um, kidding too. I mean, it, it's supposed to work. Um, but <laughs> user story, yeah. The, thank you. So everybody understand. <laughs> it's like always, especially it comes time to doing something, it always has something that uh, doesn't work. Yeah, even for me, I, it was working before. I'm not sure. I think because I thought before my demo, let me clean things up. And then after I cleaned it up last night, then I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> something happened. And so, yeah, I'm sorry in, in this case. But in this case, so let me see. I'll launch it onto my phone, but at least just quickly show it to you. But for now, what I'll do is just shut down my emulator. So in order to run it um, on this, I think if I don't tell it to run it on the emulator, um, okay. Let me kind of make sure it's in the devices. Okay, so what I can do is do a ADB kill server. Yeah, yeah, kill it. So clear it up. And now I think if I run it to devices, although, yeah, sometimes it's um, interesting too. Um, I think I have to uh, basically completely shut down my emulator. Okay, now it's all clear. So I'm just gonna try to just send it because my phone is attached. So I'm gonna, let's see, okay. But I want to make sure too, your phone too, first of all, if you attach your phone, make sure you, um, for Android, turn on your developer option. Um, I think you have to press, it was a while ago, I think you have pressed something seven times, right, the power button, then the developer option will show up. <laughs> so turn that on. After that, then you also want to make sure your debugger um, is turned on your debugger too. Then you would be able to have your phone used for debugging purpose. So, okay. So let, let's see, right now, But sometimes too, it's um, interesting. It may not ask you. I think it's already. I already kind of certified the certificate. It, certificate, right? The footprint. It comes in. It will say, "Can I?" You know, it sends that you are attaching yourself to a, to another device. It will ask you. So just say yes and allow your phone to interact with the device. So uh, that's what it is. So. Apologize. <laughs> okay. If I just run Android, if you have a device. Connected, it should send it to your device. Wait, ah, ah, <laughs> ah. So now I think it's. Uh, I ran into this too. I already actually over here. It's complaining that I need to actually have my em emulator checkbox, but it's already defined. But for some reason, sometimes again, there's some sequencing. I think it's just off key when you're like on and off switching between the two. So I apologize. But for now, I'm going to, um, what I'll do is I will just, okay, so now actually if you look at this, it's actually able to see my phone, but then it's call it unauthorized. But over here to my emulator now appears to be okay. So let's, we can, let, let, let's see if we run it and see what happens. It may be able to then send it to the emulator. But it, sometimes, as I mentioned, the emulator launch it to there. Um, again, there could be some issue that I have yet to find out why, that it might take some time <laughs> to launch it. But 
let's say if it doesn't work yet, and rather than wasting your time, what I'll do is let me go back to my code, and then I'll talk some more too. But um, uh, let me see. So in the meantime, I'll just. Uh, I'll make this small in the background, but uh, let me, in the meantime, go back to my, uh, uh, go back to a, a little bit of more talks because I, I realize I'm running short on time, so I apologize. But okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, but, but uh, trust me, we actually got it to work as using Cordova too. But um, yeah, like I said, okay. But of course, too, I wanted to also point out too, Cordova is not the one size fit all situation. I mean, as you can see, sometimes using hybrid development approach um, has its own set of challenges. Um, and earlier, I point out too, um, it relies on in the runtime, it relies on the web view to actually interpret your code, or execute your code, and translate it. So there will always be a performance issue. Yeah, oh, thank you. So there's always a performance issue. Um, so, and then I just, that's what I like to share is that the issue then with the app that I was working on back at the company I work for, um, we realized that when we launched the app, as you can see earlier in the architecture diagram, it's got um, functionality in the e-commerce side. And that actually was a killer because it's trying to make all the calls and then going through the web view on your phone became really hard and there was a lot of performance issue. So, in other words, if you want to use a hybrid approach, you probably, let's say, if your company just wants to launch something quickly, um, be able to show, demonstrate, and um, as a proof of concept, it is a perfect way to, to do, is using this uh, hybrid approach. But otherwise, too, if you want to launch like a full-blown web app onto your phone, that's not, like, suggest, it's not advisable. But let's say if you want to run your app, like a scaled-down version of some mobile app for, um, your, let's say your uh, internal employees wants to have some um, system to just check certain things. Um, simple things, they actually can be done quickly. You, you should probably like, leverage on a hybrid approach um, because it does help you to launch your app quickly too. Yeah. And then another thing too, I also kind of were able to demonstrate was actually some native features always have, it lags behind. Like if Android has some updates, then Cordova has, you actually need to wait for the version of Cordova to get updated before you can actually use those native features. So that's always a feature time lag. And then another issue with this is with the look and feel. As you can see too, hybrid approach and also Cordova too is not big on doing user interface. Um, and, but the thing is Cordova is good is with all the plugins that it has that allows you to talk to your, your phone, your devices um, capabilities um, in it. So, uh, but otherwise, if you want to do look and feel, you probably want to look into Ionic, for example. You might have heard of Ionic. Um, that's another hybrid framework, but that uh, framework is built on top of Cordova. So it's kind of get the best of both worlds in some ways because Ionic makes use of Angular, so it provides a better look and feel. Um, but it also um, leverages on Cordova's plugins. So then um, through the rich set of plugins, then it can, Ionic can then talk to your device's um, capabilities. So. And then another thing to watch out for too is the authentication and like session management of your applications too. Because in a mobile app, for example, you want to do a login sc screen. Sometimes on a web app, you may like install additional security features, such as like Captcha. So if you want to do Captcha, if you think of on your mobile phone and some users are log on, and then very soon they get timeout, then they have to use the Captcha again and log in, it's not very convenient. So if you ever want to use hybrid approach, you have to, some of the screens you may want to rethink of how you design it on the mobile deployment too. So, so those are kind of the major things to watch out for if you want to use a hybrid approach. And then there are also some alternative approaches to doing mobile app uh, quickly too. As I mentioned, uh, Ionic probably um, would be like a, a good, better solution in terms of um, if you want your, your mobile app to have a better look and feel. Um, and then of course there's also Kotlin native too. Um, I myself have not used Kotlin native, but um, I've seen Kotlin native being used to 
launch mobile app, and they give a better um, look and feel to it too. Um, basically, it has the it kind of like the native um, OS interface part, and is is and is faster as well. Um, and of course, the React Native is another option, and that's a Facebook uh, React Native um, stack. But the React Native, it, um, you have to know TypeScript. Um, even though TypeScript will eventually get translated or transpiled into JavaScript, but you, you, to code it, you do need to know TypeScript. So that's with React Native. And then for um, other approaches, um, it's actually progressive web apps, um, HTML5, I think some of you are familiar with too. Um, and then for it's just an example of a Java progressive web apps. You might have heard, heard of Vaden too. So Vaden is a Java um, kind of um, hybrid web and mobile. It allows you to write web and mobile applications too. And then another like Java uh, front end uh, development framework is called Gluon too. Um, not sure if some of you might have worked with it maybe, no? Yeah, so anyway. Because it was also being introduced at Java, Java 1 too. So, um, and also uh, Johan, Voss too, uh, he's the CEO for Gluon, so I kind of learned about this. So if you're ever interested in using Java for your mobile app, you can check into that as well. So again, these are not exhaustive lists, but these are just some of the other alternatives you can explore. Okay, so at this point too, I just want to also point out too, um, from IBM too, IBM has uh, IBM Cloud. I mentioned a bit earlier too um, about IBM Cloud Platform. As such, the cloud platform is very flexible too. It doesn't lock you in into any kind of one components that you need to use. Like basically, it's an, it allows a lot of open source underneath the hood that you can use to um, do work. For example, for mobile, right? It has a mobile foundation server. So it, it provides you better um, integration with the server side with like authentication, for example, for the other like, um, like you know, like management of enterprise um, situation, you can basically have your mobile app in Angular, in um, Cordova, in Ionic, in Kotlin, all these, and you can leverage on a mobile foundation server. That um, one thing I found it really useful is I also uh, worked on it is the authentication side. It provides you with the certificates and all these uh, setup, which in general too, like mobile app, pay attention to all the security that you need to pay attention because it's easier for any hackers that wants to like intercept your call on a mobile app. So, so that's very important and I would highly recommend you also check it out if you're kind of experimenting with, um, with like mobile, uh, looking for some mobile solution for doing more enterprise apps. So, so that's the URL, you can go to the ibm.com cloud mobile foundation. And I just want to thank you um, to, for coming to my call, uh, to, to my talk. And uh, this is my contact information and uh, and again, the IBM Cloud sign up too, if you uh, take a look in that, you can use that link too, to go to IBM's uh, Cloud site and uh, sign up for a free tier account. Um, and there's no time limit to, to use all the free tier service. Um, and the, the nice thing about the IBM Cloud platform is that again, it's a, it supports a lot of the open source functionality underneath the, underneath the hood and a lot of things, they don't have a time limit. So, and it's, it's also you can use uh, by, by, you know, you, you get, you pay for it for how much you use rather than, you know, a monthly fee. Like some other cloud provider we would say, you know, they charge you if you're, you know, on a plan. But actually it, it's quite flexible. So I encourage all of you to try it out, this uh, IBM cloud. Um, and then underneath too, you can take a look into the, the cloud platform in which you can, um, I'll, maybe I'll quickly show you too. Um, Oh, do I have time still? I know I started, okay. I'll just quickly show you that IBM Cloud, um, um, like the interface, and then you get a good sense of it, so. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, hold on, sorry. Sorry. Let's see. I think folks are going to other thing, right? Okay. So the this is just a sign up. So when you go to that link that I sent you, you can just go here and then basically sign up for it. Again, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and then you can then go to. Again, it's my fault. I think I lost that. Um, I lost that link. Um, I think I'll just, um, I think 
Okay, sorry about that. I think I may need to go back to here and then I think I might have lost that page. So. anything so then I have a lot of tabs and I'm sorry I kind of lost the yeah the Wi-Fi too is also really slow so while it is still loading let me show this yeah this this is actually the content okay so over here too um, yeah it's still slow but I already have this that I actually um, it's open. Um, so essentially, the, this is like an IBM Cloud. Um, I basically was going to show you that there's some back end, but I think it looks like we're short on time. But essentially, too, when you log on with IBM Cloud, then um, you can basically go over here and the catalog, if you click on the tab catalog, it will show you a list of all the categories of uh, services that you can um, use. And then also like um, uh, define to, you, say for example, the cloud image. Couchbase, right? The database you you should be able to like define a service for yourself, and you can have one instance of it for free. So that's what it is. And yeah, and then this unfortunately this is loading very slow, but at least I'm glad I can show this to you. But essentially, too, the the back end I was going to show you in my app is actually get launched onto IBM Cloud. So this was my uh, supposed to be my uh, talk back end. Um, again, in order to launch it, you can make use of the IBM Cloud, and it's uh, deployed on the Cloud Foundry. So there. And also, too, I wanted to point out, I'm always accessible. So if you want to get in touch with me, and we can continue the conversation, too. Um, and uh, I, have my, I don't know if you got my Twitter um, access, but you can contact me Twitter. Or I'll also send the slides out. Um, I'll give my email address. So if you want to uh, stay in touch and continue the conversation, I'll be very happy to continue. Yeah, and if you ever come to Chicago, let me know. I'll be very happy to uh, meet with you. Come to Chicago Java Users Group, too. So, yeah. Okay, well, okay, thank you. I, I want to thank you. Thank you.